finally turned the corner before lunch, and uh, we are going to be looking <clears throat> at contentment because, you know, discontent will cause you to be anxious. If you've ever been discontent about anything, it can cause you to have anxiety. So turn in your Bibles to Philippians 4, Philippians 4, verses 10 to 13. Lord, we want to pause and give you thanks and praise for your good mercy to us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Paul, who's sitting there in prison, tied to two Roman soldiers with bleeding wounds on his back, and yet he cares enough for the church at Philippi to write them a letter. While he's there, he sends back with Epaphroditus, the pastor, to have it read to the church there. I thank you for the Holy Spirit moving him to write this book. And, Father, I do pray that you would help us as we consider these four keys to contentment because certainly the Apostle Paul lived these things out, and we want to follow his legacy, and we want to be women who are known as being content. So, Father, uh, give grace, I pray, in Christ's name. Amen. One of the lies of our age is this. Contentment in life is dependent on my circumstances or the people in my life. If only I had a good marriage, I would be content. If only I was married, I would be content. Ah, if only I was single, I'd be content. Martha P. says there's two types of women. She counsels those that are married that want to be single, those that are single that want to be married. If only I had a new car or new house, I would be content. If only I had different neighbors, I would be content. Ah, if only I had a good church. I hear that all the time. If only I had a good church, I would be content. Uh, If only I had a different pastor or a different pastor's wife, I would be content. If only I had some friends, I would be content. Oh, if only I wasn't so busy, I would be content. If only I wasn't so lonely, I would be content. If only I didn't have this physical problem, I would be content. Ah, if only I could take a vacation, I would be content. Oh, if only I didn't have small children, (laughs) I would be content. If only I had children, I would be content. If only I didn't have rebellious children, I would be content. If only I had a little more money, I would be content. Uh, If only I could buy that new outfit I saw in the store, I would be content. And if only I could lose some weight, I would be content. If only I could have all this and more, I would be content. Ladies, the world has told us a lie, and we as Christian women believed it. We have believed this lie. The truth is, the more you get, the more you want. The truth truth is, the more you get, the more you want. We are rarely satisfied. And one of the most important lessons you can learn early in life and pass on to your children and your grandchildren is this. If you are not satisfied with what you have right now, you will never be satisfied with what you want. If you are not content right now with what you have, you will never be content with what you want. So ladies, If you and I are to be content, what is it? How do we get contentment, and how do we keep hold of it? Well, the Apostle Paul has some answers for us tucked away in a few verses in Philippians chapter 4. And ladies, he's able to instruct us because Paul's life was difficult. It wasn't peachy king hunky-dory, as some woman tells me every Sunday when I say, how are you, peachy king hunky-dory. It wasn't. It was hard. It was thorns. It was thistles. It was rocky road. But ladies... Through the struggles, through difficult people, difficult circumstances, Paul learned contentment, and he leaves a legacy for all of us. And he gives four keys to contentment. One key is in found in each verse. So let's see what they are. Let's read the text together, Philippians 4, 10 to 13. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you did care, though you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect and need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and abound everywhere in all things. I've learned to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So let's look at verse 10 together first of all and see the first key to contentment. Notice what Paul says. 
I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Now, we don't have time to get into all of Philippians, but I mentioned a little bit when I was talking about the book. Paul is in prison, and he mentions joy and rejoicing 16 times in this little epistle. 16 times. And he's used the word rejoice or rejoicing or joy. But now he uses a word to describe his joy, and he says, I'm greatly rejoicing. I'm exceedingly rejoicing. I'm super abundantly rejoicing. Now, what is the cause of Paul's rejoicing in the Lord there in prison? Why is he rejoicing? Is it because he hopes to get a good meal when he gets out of prison, hopes to come to this church and have the fine food we've been eating? Uh, is it that he hopes to get a Tesla when he gets out of prison and so he can go around and see all of the churches he started? No, notice what Paul says. Here's his reason for greatly rejoicing. I'm greatly rejoicing. Why? Because your care for me has flourished again, though you did care, but you lacked opportunity. Ladies, Paul was rejoicing because the church cared for him. If you know anything about the epistle to the Philippians, if you've ever studied the epistle to the Philippians, the pastor of the church at Philippi, Epaphroditus, he brought a money gift to Paul. In prison, there was very little money, very little food, very little water, and Paul needed a money gift. And so Epaphroditus walked 800 miles from Philippi to Rome. We know from chapter 2, no one cared for his soul. And so Epaphroditus took the journey. It was a hard journey. 20 miles a day was the average walking for the traveler. And on the way, according to chapter 2, Epaphroditus got sick. He almost died. And Paul says he was sick unto death, but God had mercy on him and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. So he got sick, but he, he got well, and he eventually got to Rome, and he delivered this money gift to Paul. That's why he said, you cared for me, though you did care, but it, you lacked opportunity. It had been 10 to 12 years since Paul had been there to the church at Philippi, and yet they had not forgotten that he had a need there in prison, a monetary need. Uh, did you notice that Paul didn't beg like a lot of televangelists do today? You know, I remember Oral Roberts said that, you know, he would die, and he went in a, I think he went in a room and fasted and prayed for months and months until he got the millions and billions of dollars that he needed to, uh, you know, build the praying hands and, and his craziness that is in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I live. And uh, so he didn't beg God and demand, and I, I've seen men ex actually just beat the podium like that. I demand you, God, to give me this. Ladies, Paul entrusted his needs to God. He entrusted his needs to God and learned contentment. So key number one in contentment is this. <clears throat> entrust your needs to God. Entrust your needs to God. Paul did. He was in prison. Very little food, very little water. He needed some money. He didn't get upset with the church at Philippi. He entrusted his need to God. Ladies, maybe you have a financial need, as Paul did, as he's in prison writing this letter. Whatever your need is this morning, entrust it to God, whatever the need is. Um, has God been faithful to you in the past? One lady over here, good. Yeah, <laughs> Thankful for one out of 173, I think, that are here. Is he faithful today to you? Yeah. Do you think he's going to be faithful tomorrow? Yeah, he will. Paul didn't fret, he didn't worry, he didn't get on drugs because the money wasn't on time. They wanted to help him, but they lacked opportunity because of Epaphroditus getting sick. But here's where Paul fleshed out what he writes in the epistle to the Philippians. He thought on whatever is true, lovely, just, and of good report. In fact, you know that verse is often taken out of context. Uh, it's talking about how we think about people. We're to think the best of people, lovely things about people, true things about people, good reports about people. And that's where Paul decided to choose and think what was right. Just because the money wasn't on time, he did not get frustrated. Now, the reason he didn't receive the gift before now was not because of their neglect, but because of the difficulty of getting it to him. Evidenced by the words he says, you did care but you lacked opportunity. And Paul knew it was their responsibility. He's the one that wrote that those that labor in the word and doctrine are to receive double honor, right? You're not to muzzle the ox that treads out the grain. So Paul himself wrote these things, and the church at Philippi wanted to help him, but as I mentioned, they lacked opportunity. Remember, there's no Vimo in those days. You know, people now want to put their phone up to the square that we have out there. Like, what are they doing? 
well, they're putting money. I was like, how does that work? You know, it's so weird. You know, it's like you, next thing you know, you'll be thinking it, and it'll be in the person's bank account. But there wasn't anything like that in Paul's day. Uh, there's no mail. There's no Federal Express. There's no Western Union. There's none of that stuff. And so Paul was dependent on the pastor to actually get the money, put it in his hand, and bring it to Paul there in prison. So Paul uses a very interesting word here. He says, your care for me has flourished again, uh, which means to revive or to put on uh, new shoots like uh, plants in the springtime. Uh, I don't know about you in Oklahoma, when springtime comes, uh, right now it's fall, so everything's kind of dying out. But in the spring, some of the first flowers that come up are usually the tulips and the jonquils. They're just beautiful. And so as they're coming up, it's like, what? Ah, spring is here. And you feel kind of refreshed and flourished. That's the Greek word here. He says, your care for me has flourished again, like those beautiful flowers that come up in the springtime. And ladies, I just want to encourage you before we go on to the next verse, think about the people in your life that have ministered to you, the Pauls, the Timothys, uh, those people, your pastors, uh, they need encouragement. And uh, I know, because I was a pastor's wife for 46 years, write them a note, encourage them. I, I uh, sent my pastor's last Sunday sermon to a lady I'm counseling that's going through a really rough time, and she wrote me back and she said, wow, 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 wow. <laughs> I've got to re-listen to this sermon over and over. And I sent that to my pastor. And I said, I just want to encourage you. Uh, I was not only blessed by your message, but so was this lady that I'm counseling. And so encourage your pastors. We have so many means to do that. Even just, you know, write him a note. Shoot him a text. Don't shoot him, but shoot him a text, you know. And, and thank him for the labor that he does for you. Uh, laboring in the word and doctrine is not easy. It is very challenging. And it's hard to pastor the sheep because many of them like to bite you. And uh, so we have a lot of means to encourage uh, our pastors and our leaders and those who labor for us. And so I just want to encourage you to do that because uh, even those on the foreign fields, they need encouragement. Well, Paul gives a second key to contentment in verse 11. He says, not that I speak in regard to need, for I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. Paul says, I'm not writing, I'm not speaking in regard to need. In fact, the word need means want. And it comes from the verb behind. What's he saying? I'm not lacking in anything. You're saying, what? <laughs> he's chained to a Roman soldier. He's bleeding from his back. He's been beaten 49 times. What do you mean he's not, he's not in need? Well, Paul gives the reason why he was content. And ladies, it wasn't because he had a wealthy inheritance waiting for him in the first bank of Rome. He says, I've learned to be content in whatever state I am. The word learned here means to learn by experience, to understand it. And I hope this encourages you. You know, I had to learn to be content to be a widow. It just didn't come after the day my husband passed away. I had to learn it. It doesn't come by osmosis. Now I'm trying to learn to be content without my firstborn child. It's something you learn. And so this should encourage you. It doesn't come automatically. But ladies, you know how Paul learned to be content? By going through the difficulties in life. Ladies, God allows us to go through trials, through hardships, so that we can learn contentment. So principle number two and the key to contentment is this. Learn contentment by the hardships of life. Learn contentment by the hardships of life. Paul says, I've learned it. <laughs> I've learned it. I've learned to be content. Ladies, let the circumstances of your life teach you something valuable and let it teach you to be content. The Apostle Paul had to go through hardships that you and I cannot even imagine. He did not whine about them. He did not complain. In fact, he told the church at Philippi, do everything without murmuring and complaining. He went through those trials without murmuring and complaining. In fact, turn back to 2 Corinthians very quickly. I want you to see some of the hardships. You think your life is hard? <laughs> I want you to see some of the hardships of the Apostle Paul. There's several places we could go and look at them. But look at 2 Corinthians 11, verse 24. Well, let's start with verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, and labor is more abundant, and stripes above measure, and prison more frequently, and death often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, and he's not talking about marijuana. 
Once I was stoned, three times I was in a shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep and journeys often, perils of waters, perils of robbers, perils of my countrymen, perils of the Gentiles, perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils among false brethren, weariness, toil, sleeplessness, often hungry, thirsty, fasting, cold, and naked. Besides the other things which come upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak and am I not weak? Who is made to stumble and do I not burn with indignation? If I must boast, I will boast of the things which concern my infirmity. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows I'm not lying. In Damascus, the governor and Ardeus, the king, was guarding the city of the Damascus with a garrison, desiring to arrest me, but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. <laughs> Ladies, you want to go to school with Paul? <laughs> you want to go to school with him? Doesn't sound like fun, does it? But it's the schooling that God used to teach him to be content. Maybe some of us in this room need to go through deeper hardships of life so that we can learn to be content. You know, Paul's life was always in danger. It seemed to be two different times the Jews tried to kill him. Two different times they tried to kill him. Regarding his imprisonment, do you know Paul spent 25% of his life in prison? You say, well, that's not so bad. You know, they can work out. They can get a job. They got computers. They got a canteen. They get snicker candy bars. No, no. <laughs> Roman imprisonment was preceded by being stripped naked and then flogged, a humiliating, painful, and bloody ordeal, and the bleeding wounds often went untreated. And so Paul was probably sitting in painful leg and wrist chains, and even the bloodstained clothing was not replaced, even in the cold of winter. Remember in his, one of his last epistles to his son in the faith, Timothy, he says, please, please bring me a coat. I'm cold. I'm cold here in this prison. Most cells were dark unbearably cold, lack of water, cramped quarters, sickening stench from very few toilets, made sleeping difficult and waking hours miserable. In fact, they tell us that male and female prisoners were incarcerated together, so there was a lot of sexual immorality going on. It was so bad that a lot of prisoners just committed suicide. Others would beg for a speedy death because prison was so horrible. He spent 25% of his life there, 25% percent of his life in these prisons. Regarding his missionary journeys, he traveled more than halfway around the world covering 8,000 miles by land and sea. And as I mentioned, the average uh, traveler would walk uh, three miles an hour, about 20 miles a day. They didn't have sandals. They didn't have Nike tennis shoes. And he remember says, perils in the country, perils among false brethren. So the, the danger would be what? Thieves that would rob you, bears that would attack you, wolves would attack you. And so it wasn't like, you know, uh, flying Southwest Airlines. And, well, they don't serve peanuts anymore, but they serve these really yummy graham crackers. And uh, so Debbie doesn't like them, so usually I get her, so I get double. They're really yummy. And, uh, but there wasn't any of that. It was very challenging. Uh, and yet it was, it was not only that, but when he would get to a, a city uh, and he could find an inn, which was very rare, they were usually known for their filthy sleeping quarters, extortionate innkeepers, gamblers, thieves, and prostitutes. <laughs> In fact, uh, John, according to church history, the Apostle John relates an amusing story of coming to one of those inns with a bed infested with bugs. I guess they're bed bugs. Sometimes uh, we, we wonder about that, all the hotels we stayed in. But anyway, he said he ordered the insects to depart for the night. So I don't think I have that power, but anyway. Uh, and regarding Paul's travel by boat, that would be the fastest way. But his fare did not include food or a cabin, but only water. And so the greatest uh, danger was shipwreck. He was a member of shipwreck three times, once out in the open sea, floating around cold and naked. <laughs> now, no wonder he learned contentment, right? Maybe you and I will have to go through some really difficult hardships before we learn contentment. I had hoped after COVID-19, after the pandemic, because there seemed to be a spiritual awakening. Did you notice that? There seemed to be a spiritual awakening after COVID-19. But I've noticed we've kind of gotten apathetic again, right? We've kind of become, yeah, Christianity, take it, leave it. Time in the word, take it, leave it. Ladies, we need to be awakened out of our apathy and complacency. I think we as Americans have become more engrossed in lawlessness and I think that one of the biggest reasons is because we have so much. We have so much. Do you know Americans spend more on storage units? You know what those are? Where you put all your stuff. It's like that guy in Luke. He had so much stuff he built barns to store all of his stuff. Remember what Jesus said to him, you fool? 
you fool, do you not know your soul is going to be required of you tonight? <laughs> then what are you going to do with all this stuff, right? But Americans spend more on storage units in one year than they do on McDonald's, Wendy's, and Burger King combined. And you know how much we love our fast food, right? Ladies, we're often like the church at Laodicea in Revelation where John says you're rich and increased with goods and you have need of nothing, but little do you know you're blind, you're miserable, you're wretched, and you're naked. Also worthy of noting here, Paul does not make any demands on God as I have seen some Christians do. Just because his conditions were not the best by human standards, ladies, Paul rested in the fact he was enrolled in a real Christian school. He was learning contentment. That's one of the things that disturbs me today about some people in the speaking world, the traveling world, is their demands for this or that or this much money or first class airline tickets or whatever it is. I, I know women that speak, travel and speak, and they don't want to talk to the women during the sessions. I had one woman tell me she didn't like women mauling on her. And I was like, when did we forget we're slaves? When did we forget we're servants? There is no celebrities in the Christian world, right? We're not divas. <laughs> We're slaves. We're all just using our gifts for the glory of God, right? That's what we should be doing. And Paul wasn't interested in that. Just because his conditions were not the best, ladies, he rested in the fact he was enrolled in a real Christian school. One of the ladies who has discipled me for 40 years, I've had two women that have discipled me for 40 years. They're both still alive. One's 82, one's 92. And one of them told me one time, she said, Susan, I think there's two movies playing called Christianity. There's two theaters. And she said, when we get to heaven... We're going to find out we were in the wrong theater. And I go, you're probably right. Because what we see in the scriptures doesn't look very much like what we see today, is it? Ladies, some people have the delusion that coming to Christ means health, wealth, and prosperity. That's not, that is not biblical. Jesus said in Luke 12, 15, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Paul says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we'll carry nothing out. I have now buried my husband. I buried my son. They didn't carry anything out but the clothes that were on their body. And my husband got a yellow marker in his hand because I always threatened him. I was going to bury him with a yellow marker, and I did. Because he, he did everything with yellow markers. And so I kind of follow his steps and highlight things. But I have a whole basket of yellow markers at home if you need one. Because we have a lot left over. But ladies, we brought nothing in this world. We came in naked. And we will go out with nothing. And Paul says, therefore, knowing this, with food and clothing, what? Be content. We brought nothing in this world. We're going to carry nothing out. Therefore, with food and clothing, be content. You all have clothes on. I'm so thankful. There's lots of food waiting for us. I know you're saying, hurry up so I can enjoy it. That's what we need, right? With food and clothing, be content. And yet Paul says in another place, let your life be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. Why? For he has said five times, they used to say it's three, but the Greek is five. I will never, no, never, no, never, no, never, no, never leave you or forsake you. Ladies, we have the Lord and he is enough. Paul knew the real key to contentment was not in anything this world had to offer. It wasn't in having a vacation to the Bahamas. It wasn't in buying the latest fashions. It wasn't in having a Tesla. It wasn't in going out to the finest restaurant in town. It was in his relationship with Christ. In fact, he goes on to describe his contentment in a little more detail in verse 12, and we move on to our third key to contentment. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I've learned to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Paul says, I know how to be abased. I mean, I know how to be in circumstances of want or humility, difficult situations. But he says, I also know, learn how to be content if everything's going great, super abounding. Simply put, Paul says, I'm content whether it's feast or famine. Doesn't matter. I don't care. Whatever it is, I'm content. And he's not only content with little or much, but he goes on to say, I'm content everywhere and in all things, which means the totality of everything. Every relationship, every circumstance. Ladies, does that describe you this morning? Are you content with every circumstance and every relationship you have today? That's what Paul's saying, everything, the totality of everything. And then he says, I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. In fact, it's interesting, the word learned here was a word commonly used in the mystery religions, the Gnostic religions of Paul's day. And he's using a play on words here because the Gnostics thought, the false teachers thought that they'd been initiated into a higher, 
higher Christianity, higher knowledge. And Paul's saying, uh-uh. I've, I know the secret. I've been initiated in the key to contentment. I've possessed the secret. I am content. I've learned it. Ladies, I don't know about you, but I want to be in that place in my spiritual walk. Paul's contentment was manifested, he says, when he was full or even when he was hungry. The word full here describes a supply of food in abundance. It's a, it's a word to describe uh, the feeding of the animals before you take them to the slaughter to kill them. It's like you're going to feel in a few weeks after you eat that last piece of pumpkin pie and you feel like you're going to explode. That's what it means. So full you think you're going to explode. So he says, I, I'm content. But he also says, I'm content even if I'm hungry, which means to be famished. Uh, we don't know much about that, do we? Uh, we really don't know about being hungry. Uh, I, I grew up being hungry, and I didn't know why until the age of 30 I found out I had two stomachs. It made a lot of sense because I just remember being hungry all the time and thought, why am I so hungry all the time? And when I went out with my husband, he said, I'd never taken a girl out for a date that to eat as much as you did. He said, every time my hand went down for a piece of pizza, so did yours. And then on the way home back to Moody, you wanted a hot fudge sundae, and then you wanted a six-pack of Reese's peanut butter cups. And he goes, I never saw a woman eat like you. And uh, but anyway, I do have two stomachs, and they both function. And uh, I, just, I have a point to this story. <laughs> but anyway, I went on a diet one time with my daughter. This was, don't try this at home. But uh, we went on the 10-day maple syrup lemonade diet. And uh, my daughter wanted me to do this because she says, Mom, we're going to lose a pound a day. And I go, okay, that sounds great. I could lose some weight. So day eight came of this diet, and she was home from college that day, that week. And so day eight came of this diet, and I went into where she was in the kitchen. We were remodeling my kitchen. And I said, Cindy, I love you, but I am getting off this diet. I said, I really, I really think I might die. I was so hungry. Eight days without food is a long time. And I, I just felt I was going to die. And so I said, I love you, but I'm off this diet. So I, I went into the kitchen, went to the pantry, and opened it up. And first thing I saw were those crispy saltine crackers. And I remember getting one of those out, and I put it in my mouth. And I said, this is the most wonderful thing I've ever tasted <laughs> in my entire life. It's so good. And... Uh, and I really, that was the most famished I can ever remember. In fact, when I found out I had two stomachs, I asked my mom, I said, what was I like as a baby? She said, well, I couldn't, I couldn't feed you enough. She said, I had to finally wean you because uh, you, I'd feed you both sides of the breast and you'd scream. And uh, so anyway, I don't know why I'm telling that story, but anyway, that's <laughs> not part of my testimony, but that's part of who I am. I'm a freak show. And then a few years later, I was getting a root canal. This isn't in my notes either. And the periodontist called all of his employees. He goes, I've never seen this in my whole life. This woman has double roots and canals in her teeth. So I don't know. I'm just fearfully and wonderfully made. And I'm, <laughs> I'm weird. I, can't, I mean, I'm just weird. So there we go. But uh, Paul says he was content. Whether he's so full, he feels like he's going to pop. Or whether he's so hungry, he thinks he might die. He says, I am content. So ladies, key number three to contentment is this. Live independent of your circumstances. Live independent of your circumstances. Didn't matter to Paul. Full, I'm content. Hungry, I'm content. Have good relationships, I'm content. Bad relationships, I'm content. I have everything. Staying at the Hilton, I'm content. Sleeping in India in a hotel on a hard bed. <laughs> Debbie and I used to do that and put the furniture up against the wall, scared, not knowing what might happen to us, but be content, right? Be content. And you might say, well, Susan, how did Paul do this? You know, did he give himself a good psychiatrist, <laughs> good biblical counselor? Was he in denial? No, he held the things of this world loosely. He's already said our citizenship is in heaven, right? Our citizenship is not here. He didn't mind earthly things like the enemies of the cross of Christ. His God was not his appetite. In fact, Paul's key to contentment was in his relationship with the living God, as we see in verse 13 as we close up. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Did you notice what Paul said? I, it's okay, you can call it talk. I what? Can. What do most people say? I can't. I hear it all the time in the counseling room. I can't. You know what they're really saying is I won't. I won't. Ladies, can't is not a word that should be in the Christian's vocabulary when you consider what Paul is saying. We can. And, and it's the context. This verse is taken out of context all the time. The context is contentment. I can be content. I can. I can be content. In fact, the word do here means to be strong, to be able, to be strengthened. 
Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul's not saying I can do all things like build a barn, change a tire, or go without sleep for a week or any other such ridiculous thing that I have heard people say. But the all doing all things is the context of contentment. Ladies, we can be content in sometimes what seems like the most impossible circumstances. We can be content. How does Paul do this? Notice what he says. Through Christ who strengthens me. Through Christ, the Greek word is, through Christ who infuses strength into me. So ladies, the fourth key to contentment is this. Draw upon your resources in Christ Jesus. Draw upon your resources in Christ Jesus. I'll tell you about that in just a minute. Paul says, I can do this through Christ who strengthens me. Ladies, how did Paul endure all those hardships mentioned in 2 Corinthians 6 and 11? We didn't look at chapter 6, but there's some there too. How did he endure those hardships we just read about? The answer lies in this verse, through Christ who strengthens me. Paul says in Romans 8, 37, Yet in all these things we're more than conquerors through him who loved us so. He also says not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves. Our sufficiency is in Christ. And even when he asked the Lord three times to take away that thorn in his flesh, and God told him, no, I'm not going to take it away from you, Paul. You know what he said to him? Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. And you know what Paul said? Therefore, I'll glory in my infirmities. Why? So the power of Christ, the Shekinah glory of Christ, will rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in persecutions. I take pleasure in all this. Why? For when I'm weak, then I am strong. Ladies, without the connection to Christ, you will never know contentment. You will never know contentment. Each one of us has a choice in the area of contentment. In fact, did you notice Paul's will in all of this? If you listen carefully to those four verses, I rejoiced, I have learned, I know how, I can, I can, I know. Paul had a choice, just like you and I do, and Paul chose contentment. So do you desire contentment in your life this day, or is your life one of discontent, continually focusing on what you don't have and what you think you still need to be content. There are four keys to contentment according to this text. Number one, entrust your needs to God. What are your needs today? What are your needs? What are you doing about them? Are you fretting? Are you complaining? Are you sinning to attain those needs? Ladies, why not entrust your needs to God? Cast your care upon the Savior. He cares for you. Principle number two, learn contentment by the hardships of life. Do you shrink at the trials God brings your way? Lord, not that one, not that one. Do you see it as a part of the course you enrolled in when you committed your life to Christ? Did you consider the cost of his lordship? Jesus said, consider the cost. We must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom of heaven. Maybe some of us need to pray for more hardships so that we might learn contentment. Key number three, live independent of your circumstances. What are your circumstances? Are you rich? Are you poor? Are you lonely? Are you too busy? Are you sick? Are you well? Are you childless? Are you single? Ladies, whatever your circumstances are today, live independent of them. I tell women all the time in difficult marriages, you can live independent of your circumstances. You can be happy and be fulfilled in a difficult marriage. This is not our home. We're just passing through. We're just passing through. Live for the kingdom to come. The fourth key to contentment is this. Draw upon your resources in Christ. Draw upon your resources in Christ. Ladies, what things are causing you discontent today? Are you drawing upon your resources? You might say, Susan, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, right here. <laughs> You have 66 letters. Have you read them? I'm appalled at the amount of women I know that have never read Genesis to Revelation. Ladies, how are you going to stand in the day of adversity if you don't know what this book says, right? This is Peter says he's given us everything right here in this book that we need for life and godliness, right? So this is one resource that we have, God's word. We also have prayer, right? We have a wonderful privilege to come before the throne of God that we might find help in our time of need. We have a great high priest that's been touched with all the feelings of our infirmities. He knows us. He made us. So that's a resource. Also, people. Look at all these sisters in Christ. This is a resource Christ has provided for you. I was talking to a, an 
don't know where she is, but a girl here who just lost her brother. Uh, and, and I get it because my daughter's struggling with losing her only sibling. And I was talking about how to, you know, help her, her parents in the book that I just read by Tim Challies. Uh, he lost his son. And so the, these are some of the resources you have to encourage each other. You comfort others with the comfort you have been comforted with, right? So his word, his prayer, his people, the Holy Spirit of God that lives within you, that's a resource that Christ has provided for you. Learning contentment comes by yielding to whatever God allows in your life and then allowing whatever he allows to draw you close to him. In closing, several years ago, well, actually, it's been a long time ago. I think my daughter's been married 24 years now. But right after she got married, uh, her husband let her go to Honduras with me. It was my first time at that uh, third world country. And I was going over there to speak, and I thought, well, this is going to be great. Time with my daughter, time to minister to these women, and blah, blah, blah. And um, I remember on one of the afternoons, the missionary there, her name was Ginger, and she said, would you and your daughter like to go uh, with me to where we minister, my husband and I, in this village? And I said, sure, sounds great. So we jumped up in her Jeep. And if you know anything about a lot of the third world countries, they don't have a lot of roads, just a lot of rough terrain. So we finally got to this village, and we drove up to what was a manufactured house made out of cardboard and a little metal. And the house was about maybe the size of my closet at home. So we pull up, and a lady meets us at the door. She's pregnant with her fifth child. She has no teeth, and she's smiling like crazy, and she invites us in to sit down, and the only place to sit is a dirt floor. And uh, so we sit down on the dirt floor, and we start listening to this woman. We found out her husband was out looking for food. They have not had, had not had food for three days. So they had five children. She was pregnant with her fifth child. She had four children, five on the way, and so he'd gone out to buy some food or find some food. And so we were sitting on the dirt floor there, and we were listening to this woman. Just, I mean, she was smiling and so happy. And she was talking about the faithfulness of God, the faithfulness of God by her visit, what that meant to her, the faithfulness of God of the missionary providing prenatal vitamins for her, the faithfulness of God by the missionary providing worm medicine for her children. And we found out after we left there that most children in Honduras don't get that privilege, so eventually worms start coming out of their nose, their mouths, their ears, and I was just like, what in the world? And I remember after we came back to America, the first Sunday back in my husband's church, and I was standing there, we were singing, and I was looking around at all the people in my church, and I thought, what in the world is wrong with American Christianity? Something's wrong. We have fine houses, we have enough food and medication for our children, but we're weak in our faith. We're weak in our faith. This woman had nothing. She was destitute, and yet she was content. There wasn't any complaining out of her mouth the whole time we were there, but only praising God for his mercy in her life. You might say, Susan, why are you sharing this with us? Because this woman learned contentment by the four principles we just studied. This woman learned contentment not by attaining this thing or that person, but she learned contentment by entrusting her needs to God she learned contentment by the hardships of life. She learned contentment by living independent of her circumstances. And she learned contentment by drawing upon her resources in Christ. This woman had genuine joy in her heart because her joy came from Christ alone. And my friend, he is enough. Father in heaven, forgive us for our discontent. Forgive us for murmuring, for complaining. We have so much. <laughs> Even today, we have this beautiful church to worship in. We have beautiful friends to talk to. We have wonderful food to eat. And yet, we murmur and complain so often. So, Father, please help us. Please forgive us. And help us to be content, which will result in having a peaceful heart <laughs> and not being anxious, not being worried about anything. As Thomas Watson says, if we would be content, we'd never sin. So, Lord, help us. Help us in this area. We can't do this without your help. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.